Hello and welcome to the i3 Insights podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. As you probably know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. The following recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. Today we have a very special guest on the i3 podcast. Uh, To many of our listeners, he needs no introduction, but uh, for some of you, we'll introduce him anyway. It is uh, Jeremy Grantham. He is the chairman and founder of GMO, an asset allocation and investment strategy group based in Boston. Uh, I was going to introduce Jeremy as chairman and founder, but he corrected me and said that his title is more accurately chief bullshitter and propagandist. So on that note, I'd like to introduce Jeremy to the podcast. Hello. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for joining us. We like to start our podcast by going back right to the beginning. And uh, it would be interesting to find out a little bit about your journey and how you became an investor. At weekends. My family in South London had uh, some very good friends up the road, and he worked for a European-wide scaffolding company, and he was a head of marketing. And um, he always talked a good story, like most long-term employees. And um, I thought, well, that would be a good idea to invest in. This company was clearly going to take over the world. And... um, it was called Acro Engineering. And uh, I had, at 16 years old, I had a home safe account where, for the last 15 years, 10 years, I had been putting my half crowns and occasional 10 shillings in this little box, and then I'd take it down to the bank and they'd open it and stick it in my passbook and stamp it. And so I arrived without any discussion with my parents, I arrived and said, could I speak to the bank manager of our little local uh, Barclays Bank? And um, he was quite entertained by the idea. And I said, could I use my home safe account to buy some stock? He said no one had ever done it before, but there was no reason he could think of why not. And so I I used up most of my money to buy some acro shares. And uh, eight years later, I was off to um, Boston to Harvard Business School and the shares had done pretty well, not outrageously well. They maybe had doubled in eight years or, and I sold them to my mother uh, at a slight discount and she also had got a small holding. The company then went bankrupt, which <laughs> which makes you feel pretty bad as a son, but uh, it wasn't a bad trade. So from 16 years on, I was I was thinking about investing and uh, did quite a bit while at business school with a few friends. Uh, and uh, immediately afterwards, I went into management consulting only to discover that my friends in, in the investing business were having much more fun. And so after a rather painful 18 months, I transferred to... Uh, to investing and came from New York back to Boston, working for a mutual fund group. Uh So who would you say were your early uh, mentors or influences during that period? Well, at an even earlier period, I was brought up by my grandfather. My father died in the war before I met him. And uh, my grandfather was born a Quaker. And uh, even though he gave up on religion. He he was a typical Quaker in how he lived his life. And he was a Yorkshireman, which are very frugal, we like to say. Uh, they make Scotsmen look like spendthrifts. Anyway, they're very careful. And they don't like flashy expenditure, and they love bargains. And so I grew up uh, with a great Yorkshire-type, even Quaker-type love of, of, of bargains and, uh, and careful 
the spending. You got into the business in Boston after a, a stint in management consulting. What prompted you to start your own firm? Yeah, what would what would not prompt you? I mean, people did start new firms. It was an area where you could. You didn't have a huge capital requirement. All you needed was a certain amount of confidence and good fortune. And um, we planned and plotted from day one, um, and it wouldn't work out, and then you try another one, and that didn't work out. And the third one, uh, a guy from another mutual fund group and I put together a team, and we were ready to go, and we propositioned my boss at Keystone Mutual Fund. And he said he wouldn't, and then he said he would, and then he said he wouldn't do it with us, but he would start his own. And would we join with him? And since I knew him for 18 months, I jumped ship and uh, we set off. So one mutual fund manager with some decent amount of experience and one kid with 18 months experience. And... uh, We um, hired a couple more people and rolled the dice. My senior partner thought we'd have a billion dollars at the end of one year, and we had (laughs) $100,000. Four orders of magnitude. That's a good miss. And uh, Let's hope your forecasting improves somewhat. Yeah, yeah. I think that was probably the biggest miss. And it wasn't my forecast anyway. It was his. And he became very, uh, very good at... uh, propaganda in an age when not too many people worried about it and uh, our firm called Battery March Financial Management kind of flashed onto the scene as doing new and original things a lot of computer work and uh, my contribution was that we should get into indexing so we did Uh, 1971 we offered an index a pretty much co-equal first with Wells Fargo and we split the business it was very slow to start but eventually in a couple of years we were splitting the business with Wells Fargo which for a small firm new to the business was pretty good and it was a real testimonial to my senior partner Dean LeBaron's ability to uh, to propagandize and so I owe him by the way Uh, Mm -hmm. I owe him the idea that in the investment business it's if you have a good idea that's one thing but it's much better if you can put it across Mm -hmm. So what led you to GMO from Battery March? How did that fell out with said Dean LeBaron, really? Uh, and uh, a whole cluster of us left and um, decided that it would be better to completely please ourselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, it worked out well. Clearly. No, I mean the first few years. You, you need a, a running start when you... That's your maximum vulnerability in an investment firm. It's the first few years. And, and since any known investment style can have a down leg, um, you better not have a down leg when you're starting. Mm-hmm. And there's never been a manager so good that he never had a down leg. So you need unmitigated good fortune. And to give you a measure of our good fortune, we won the first nine years in a row straight by an average of eight points a year. And those of you who know the rule of 71 or 72, that means we doubled the money that our clients had relative to the market. And since the market was up fairly handsomely, about a double over that time period, we quadrupled it. And that is a very, very good way to start a new firm. I look back, and that's long ago now. We're 40 years old, and that was the first, the first nine years. I look back quite nostalgically sometimes. And, and we took it for granted. You know, it just seemed you went to work, you did your best, and you won. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it didn't turn out in the long run to be quite that easy. Reminds me of a, a piece of research that uh, you might be appreciate being a Yorkshireman about cricketers who score 100 on debut. Yes. They are statistically uh, less likely to get dropped they end up having longer careers and they're more likely to have a higher batting average through that career. And and furthermore, 
if you have the nerve to get a hundred on your debut, uh, you you probably quite a, a tough nut as well in everything in life. Mm -hmm. That must be fairly nerve wracking your first professional outing, and to do it with a hundred runs means you've got talent as well as nerve. So mm -hmm. you're going to go far. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that GMO is is quite famous for is this legendary capacity to suffer as an organization <laughs> <laughs> to to stick to your process despite what the market throws at you and and even despite uh, what clients may do what do you attribute this resilience to well back in in the critical era of 98 99 i had a very substantial control over a big chunk of the firm and uh, my values had had spread around my my division uh, which was quantitative and uh, one of my values is be patient have confidence in the end that a good analysis on on the market will be right good analysis on a company can always miss the point but good analysis on a broad a broad market or a broad sector very likely in the long run to be right you have to worry about the timing our timing was terrible but at least when we looked at the data every time we suffered it it got cheaper and our confidence went up at least mine did and it got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and the confidence went higher and higher and and uh, it, it really was with hindsight uh, of course obvious that we would win if we could stand our ground the market in 1929 sold at 21 times earnings, and it never sold above that until the end of 97. And then it moved past the record high, and and we kept our cool, and we were playing in the market. And when it hit the, the peak, all-time peak of 1929, we thought, well, we better start getting pretty darn defensive, and we did. And within six months, we were about as defensive as we could be, and we watched the PE of the market go through 21 to 25, 27, 29, 31, 30, finally 35 times earnings, which one has to agree is not a little bit above 21. And during that two and a quarter years, the earnings they claimed were going up very fast as well. So the market almost doubled from its previous peak of, of late 97. That is a pretty painful uh, period. And, and we lost perhaps 60% of our new asset allocation business uh, then. But the numbers became so ridiculous that at 35 times earnings, uh, you were pretty sure it was going to go down. But better than that, under the surface, there was an unprecedented gap between the value stocks and the growth stocks. Uh, or about co-equal with what it had been in 1974. And... Um, there was a definite world record gap between small cap and large cap. And there was a preposterous gap between U.S. REITs and, uh, and the S&P. U.S. REITs, for example, yielded 9.1%. And the S&P yielded a never seen that lower level of 1.6. And people said, yes, of course, but... S&P has a lot of growth, and we worked out exactly what the difference was. And the S&P had outgrown the REIT index by 1.0% a year. And in return, you've got a, more than a seven-point premium on your, on your cash dividend. And um, so we had a very large bet on REITs. And at the bottom of the market, the REIT index was up 35%, and, uh, and the S&P was minus 50, which... Uh, which is a nice spread. So we much more than made up for the pain, but we'd lost a lot of business, and none of them came back. Uh, however, luckily, lots of other people looked at our performance and said, ah, splendid fellows, they stood their ground, we like that kind of style, and they, they threw money at us. And uh, we, uh, in the space of five years, we went up by uh, seven times. Mm -hmm. So how did you maintain your motivation during that period? Because two and a half years of the market going against you must have felt like an eternity at the time. 
How did you keep your focus, your discipline? One of the ways is to um, redo the research, push it a little further, look for mistakes that you've made, and we'd come out of those those little research fits feeling better each time. It, it was it was good data we had. We'd covered everything. There was no question uh, that this was a classic bubble of the old school variety. Nothing like it between 1929 and 1999, the two great bubbles of uh, U.S. investment history, and had all the symptoms. We read the history books. We knew all about 1929, and uh, we knew we were in the real McCoy and that it would end badly. We actually were interviewed by The Economist, and we got to say in very early 2000 that we thought the S&P would halve and the uh, NASDAQ would go down by three quarters, 75%. It went down by 82, and the S&P had the decency to drop by exactly 50%. <laughs> so we nailed that sucker. Incidentally, The Economist did a follow-up story uh, congratulating us. And uh, I was having hip replacement. I was in bed on, on Beacon Hill here. And uh, m my son calls up. And I said, Ollie, Ollie, got to read The Economist. They're really saying nice things about me and about our firm. And, and he's saying, Dad, turn on the television. Turn on the television. I said, Ollie, Ollie, you've got to be serious. This is a really big thing for me. He said, Dad, turn on the television. So I turned it on. And unfortunately, that was 9-11. Uh, and uh, if there was ever an issue of The Economist that was read by nobody, as in nobody, that was it. So the only time they said really nice things about us, uh, sad to say, was a dismal time for everybody in the financial community. One of our guys, unfortunately, had left and gone to a firm there. That was really sad. Indeed, indeed. So on this capacity to to stick with your view and... and refine your research and based on that experience that you went through what suggestions would you give to investment teams and investment committees that you think would help them to make better decisions well i think challenge every idea do not let it get into a religion i think value managers tend to be worshiping a little too much in, in the church of value, these are the rules, and the patron saint is uh, Ben Graham. And actually, Ben Graham, 1963, late stage conversion to really being a lot more open-minded about, mm -hmm. about the central truths, which I, I wrote up a couple of years ago. And um, challenge everything, keep your mind open, trial and error, Try things in a small way. Learn in the real world how they work and do it quickly. Move fast. Be an early adopter. And we were one of the first to do a lot of things. One of the two or three first firms into quant building computer models with PhDs in particle physics, you know, <laughs> beavering away. We were one of the first in, in serious asset allocation and um, and quite a few other things. One of the first people to we tried uh, having a forestry and farmland unit to capitalize on a on a thought that they were mispriced assets, which they were. But in the end, it was it was too high maintenance, didn't fit too well with more regular products. But that was the point. Try everything. We had plenty of failures along the way, but we. We had plenty of successes. And when you're an insider, your hit rate is much better than venture capital. In a, as a general principle, you, you know more, you know the clients better, you can hear what they're short of, what they want. Listen to clients. Can you tailor your service to be more useful to them? Try and work as an agent rather than selling them something. Uh, work with them help them in any way you can think of, um, and then be brave. Uh, in general, 90% plus of all investment management is too chicken. 
saying to my colleagues just now, actually, that there's a pretty big gap in the hit rate between your ideas, your general ideas, and those one or two every few years where you really think, my God, this is too good to be true. I can hardly believe this. Look at this idea. And you don't win all of those because every now and then you make a really a mistake of missing some subtle point. But you win probably 80% plus of those. And you win, if you're lucky, if you're good, you win 60 of the rest. And, and, and yet we don't differentiate typically in our industry. And it's something I complain about fairly continuously. Nag, I think, is the word. My colleagues here. When, when you have a good idea, when you think the wind is in your sail, you've got to hit the sucker. Classic example. 18 months ago, the, the Schiller PE, the 10-year smooth PE on emerging was 10. It had never been lower than 10 in 25 years. That day, the Schiller PE on the US was 21 or 22. Two years earlier, um, or three years earlier, a few years earlier, anyway, um, in in uh, early 08, Emerging had sold at a premium to the S&P. So you knew it could be a premium, and now it's down less than half. And as cheap as it has ever been, absolutely. And that's just 18 months ago. And nothing else was very attractive. Why would you put 10% in emerging? Why would you put 15? Why would you put 20? And uh, I'm pleased to say, in a way, that I put 50% of my sister's pension fund and my children uh, into emerging. And, um, and when I wrote this up, I have to say, why didn't I put 100? What was I thinking of? I couldn't even take my own medicine. But this is the point. You have one asset class that is cheap and everything else is expensive. And the one asset that is cheap is 28 countries, including China, India, Brazil. I mean, the countries that will be the main backbone of growth from here to 2100. It's, it's massively diversified, isn't it? So why would you worry about diversification? And yet, such is the mantra, diversify, diversify, diversify. And that's transferred into terrible uh, career risk, which runs and ruins, to some extent, our business. So everyone feels, well, so I, I put 20 or 18 into emerging. How, how dangerous, how risky. And 82% into overpriced, diversified rubbish. And, and how do you justify your existence with that portfolio? And, um, and there is a lot of career risk. If you, if you make a 40% move, which would have been nice, commercially and you and you miss it and the market goes down strongly and emerging goes down more because people think it does uh, they'll shoot you for being an idiot uh, of course emerging was so much cheaper it, it would not have gone down if the market had broken nearly as much as the S&P done a lot of research on that people get carried away with the relationship with the market the so-called beta and beta is important, but value is important. If you go into a market overpriced, like emerging market did in, in 2008, you will drop like a stone. I mean, they went down 60% in three or four months. They, they fell much faster than the S&P. If you go in cheap as small cap and REITs, which act like small cap most of the time, in, in 2000, small cap value was up three. S&P minus 50. As I said, the REITs were up 35. Um, but they were high beta stocks. They were 1.2 times the market beta, and they went up with an S&P down 50 because value is so, as always, so important when it becomes extreme. And uh, so I don't think there's any material chance if the market breaks tomorrow that, that emerging will end up at the bottom having gone down materially more than the S&P. In fact, I think the odds are much better than 50-50 that it will have gone down materially less. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to hear your views on emerging, and we'll come back to your market views a little later. But before we do, uh, you've been very frank in your quarterly letters about the divergence of views amongst you and the other senior members of your team. And uh, we'll dig into the detail about that a little later on, but 
first, I just wanted to ask you a general question about how you accommodate different views, uh, because it seems to be a rarity in our industry. There seems to be a tendency towards groupthink or enforcing a house view. Uh, so how do you accommodate that diversity? And then how do you integrate it into a, a portfolio that you're all comfortable with? To yeah, a greater so or lesser degree? let's take asset allocation. My sidekick for 10 years and my co-manager for seven or eight became the boss quite a long time ago, Ben Inker. And it's his job to make the final call. So he listens to me talking about possible melt-ups, and he listens to James Montier, who's very well known, particularly in Europe, but also Australia, uh, talking about potential meltdowns, and he has to work out how much influence. And actually, it served an interesting purpose because he's tried to build in resilience uh, more than we used to. You know, we ask on almost every investment, how does it do on the upside? How does it do on the downside? And you can, I think, uh, if you try hard, you can get a slightly more resilient portfolio uh, than you would if you were ignoring that uh, that possibility. It also keeps firmly in everybody's mind that we live in an uncertain world, and very few bets are certain. And uh, to have experienced, thoughtful people making their best case at uh, at opposite extremes. Um, I think can only keep the brain turning over and keep everybody challenging and thinking and arguing, which is how you get to good weighted average decisions. And that what, that's what Ben does, really. And he doesn't have to tell us whether he's giving James Montier more weight than mine, because that's not very good <laughs> for, for business. So we, he does it, he keeps it to himself. And... I can I can see that he, he owns a little more emerging because of me than he would have done. Maybe quite a bit more. So that's a small victory on that one, and then James will have a small victory on something else. And uh, that's fine. You can't run an organization where people don't think for themselves. How can everyone think the same thing who's got a brain? That's a, that's a farce. And if you don't want them to think for themselves, don't get them. Um, so you have to deal with that problem. And the only way you can do it is is uh, have different opinions, have everyone work, have everyone try and persuade each other, and have one person uh, who's proven that they can handle it make the final decision and gets the responsibility for winning or losing, really. I think that's very true. I think you need a, a group of people that uh, are intellectually curious and also have uh, enough self-confidence not to feel insecure uh, as a result of the, the debate that comes with you know, working through these sorts of questions. Yeah, and by far the biggest risk in the long run is to try and avoid risk, to try and hedge everything out together. Uh, you've got to learn to take some risk, hit the ball hard. You don't get that many great opportunities to make money, and uh, you have to whack it. Mm -hmm. So continuing on this theme of uh, of how you're seeing the world at the moment, you've been quoted and misquoted about what you see as being different in the current environment. So here's your opportunity to set the record straight. What is or isn't different this time? Let, let me just jump ahead a, a second to my paper of first trading day in January, which was bracing yourself for a possible near-term melt-up. Um, because that was has been laughably misquoted, because having been misquoted a lot last year, I thought, well, I'm going to get them this time. I'm going to put in the actual numbers. And I said, this is what a melt-up would look like. If it, if it met the pattern of the least of the classic melt-ups, it would have to go up 60% in the final 21 months. And of course, it's been going up pretty steadily. So what would that look like? And my best guess is that it would, and you have to have the prices accelerating, it would take between 9 and 18 months. And the quicker it gets there, the lower the number has to be. So if it took 9 months, 3,400 on the S&P would do it, and if it took 18, it would be 3,800. And that was 25 to 35% the day I wrote it. 
and it was reported as me saying the market would go up 60%. I said, by the end of the bubble, it will have been up 60%. Not that it's going. So I put in the numbers, didn't stop people misquoting. Um, I should have spelled it out at least twice, the front and the end of the article, that it was 25 to 35% would get us into bubble territory. And it may go deeper into bubble territory. 1929 did not go up 60% in 21 months. It went up 105. Mm. Uh, so there are always complete outliers. But this has all the indicators of, of a market that intends to end up as one of the great bubbles, in my opinion. And that the basic building block is eight or nine years or 10 years of, of building a base. And we had that through the 20s, ending in 29. Uh, and we had it through the 90s, ending in 2000. We also had it through the 50s, but the 50s didn't work because after World War II, everything was so cheap and so different. Millions of soldiers coming home, taking uni university degrees, et cetera, et cetera, building families, having babies, and with lots of buying power from selling their war bonds up their sleeve. And at the end of 10 years, the market had been wonderful, but it was still cheap. In 1955, it was nothing like a bubble, uh, and there were none of the other indicators of bubbliness, uh, which are the touchy-feely, crazy behavior stories that you read about in 1929 and, and you experienced if you were around in, in 99, uh, where Cisco became the biggest company in the world for eight seconds and uh, Pets.com you know, became market cap of hundreds of millions of dollars with the loony idea of racing around with pet food uh, on a bicycle or whatever. And there were hundreds or even thousands, for all I know, of these crazy internet stocks. And uh, every every day you'd go out for lunch, and, and uh, as I like to say, the classic symptom of all was that they weren't showing our local football team, the Patriots, uh, playing in replays. Uh, they were talking heads telling us to buy Pets.com. And that has not arrived. And back in November when I was writing this thing, you could say that for eight or nine years, it'd been one of the great boring bull markets where people had been pessimistic all the way up. And they were just beginning to perk up a little bit in November, December. And I described, that's what you need to see. You, see, you need to see a lot of perking. You need to see uh, the beginnings of really crazy behavior, crazy stories. And you need your nephew to come out of the woodwork and have the first question on the telephone be, what's happening in the stock market? Or what's happening to Bitcoin. And it was like lighting the touch paper and retreating to a safe distance. This thing arrived on our website on January the 2nd, and the first six trading days of the year were all all time world record highs, one after another, six in a row. First time anything like that in history has ever happened. I think we've had 13 all time highs out of the last 18 trading days. Yeah, I think. something like that. Yeah. And the emerging markets uh, is up 10% uh, yesterday, on Friday, uh, for the year. And the S&P was up 7.7 and, and EFA, uh, the other developed index, other developed countries, w was up a little bit less, about 7 points. So a kind of global event. But better than the surge in price, and the, and the biggest characteristic of a blow-off phase is acceleration. You go from the last nine years has averaged 1.33% a month. And you, you accelerate the typical blow-off phase to 2.5% a month. And you can see that on any chart. It's a, it's a lot of difference. It compounds pretty darn fast. And of course, 7.7 <laughs> is three months worth in, in uh, three and a half weeks. And, and even better than that, the bubbly stuff has gone crazy. So the tone of the newspapers in one month is almost unrecognizable. And certainly going back three months is, is completely different. Um, last year, we had a, a week in the spring where we had three new highs in one week and no one cared. It wasn't on news. It wasn't in the newspapers. Now, when we have three in a week, we, we read it in the FT eight times and we read it in the Wall Street Journal. Trump we, tweets it. <laughs> Trump tweets it. We have it on, we have it on, uh, uh, on the television and news. And, uh, and everybody's happy. And Bitcoin, the craziness of Bitcoin and all those little things that, that go up 10 times in three months, that is exactly what you want to see. Ideally, we want to see an IPO window, say in the spring, 
a new higher level of of deals, uh, mergers and acquisitions. That would be classic, and another dozen crazy stories. A lot of the indicators of confidence are shooting upwards, and, and look very interesting. Um, but my feel is not yet. We still have room to go. We're not as crazy anywhere near as 99. The hot stocks are actually terrific companies with real earnings, and they are nothing like as expensive as the idiot stocks got in 99. Mm -hmm. Is a, a distribution phase or a, a rotation in market leadership something that you're looking for as a... No, the possibly. typical end of a, of a bubble is that the leadership gets narrower and narrower. It goes from, you know, 40 tech stocks to 30 to 20 to 10 to Cisco. And the same thing in, in, in 1929, all the junky stocks that were brilliant in 28 get dropped by the wayside and you concentrate on Coca-Cola and radio and General Motors. And um, that seems to be a very distinctive pattern. And it causes a very odd thing, and that is conservative, low, low volatile stocks that should do much less well on the upside that do better. So in 1928, the junk trashed the, um, the blue chips. But in 1929, the opposite happened. Market went up the final 35%, and the junk was down. Wasn't Didn't even get the sign right. And uh, nothing like that happened until 1972. And 72 wasn't bad. 72 ushered in a 62% real decline. By far the biggest decline since the Depression still today. And that, that was preceded by this odd divergence. And last year, we have a high-quality fund and a high-quality index. And that was eight points ahead of the S&P. And the junk was seven points behind. That's not bad. Not enough to completely ring my bell, but it's, it's a, a promising down payment. It's what you should see if you're perhaps getting to the last six months or nine months of this game. Now, if it really travels at this speed, if we were to go even at a slower rate, 10 points in the next two months, we would actually hit the 60% in 21 months, in two months. And because it's moved so fast, it wouldn't have to go to 3,400. It could do it at 3,200, which is 10% away. And so the faster you go, the, the, the lower the price level needed. If you're going to take another 18 months, then you have to get up to 36 or 7 or 8 from here. And that's because the acceleration is the key feature. The, it's because acceleration is a key feature. It's also because if you can hit the target tomorrow, 10% in a day, it means to go back 21 months, you're picking up more months. And since the market's been going up nicely, you get more, you get more in your tail. If it takes eight months to go up 10%, you lose eight months of your 21 months, so you're losing performance. Mm -hmm. So the faster you go up, the better, the quicker you hit your 60%. Sure, I get it. So related to this, you asked me yeah. though, question, what is different? And I wrote a lot of papers on this couple anyway. And basically I ended up saying, what the hell is not different? You know, we, we don't have children like we used to. Population growth has really come slamming down from the, in terms of the labor offered to the workforce, trend line growth used to be about one and a half percent a year. And now it's 0.2. That means that comes straight off GDP growth as a trend line growth potential. And then productivity had dropped from 1.7 to 1.3 because the manufacturing, which is still good, has gone down from you know 40% to 25%. And finally, uh, it, 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 it's on its way to uh, 9 or 10. Mm -hmm. and, and you just can't get any more blood out of that stone. It's very productive, but it's very few people doing it. And in the service sector, what can you do when you're cutting someone's hair or managing their money? You know, there's, there's just so much you can do. So productivity in a service-driven society tends to, tends to get less. And people obsess about entertainment, but that's one fairly narrow um, focus. Um, and for every benefit you get from a smart telephone, you waste uh, half an hour doing unnecessary uh, Facebooking and E emailing and, and keeping up with your emails, real drag on time. 
and and playing spider solitaire um, <laughs> because you can't stop. I, I'm a bit of an addictive personality, so I I, I curse these uh, these smart instruments, but do not think that they are all productivity gains because they're not. And productivity has slowed. So productivity at 1.3, labor at 0.2. That's a 1.5% uh, growth rate potential that I've been saying since '09. So I was very early on that one. The IMF will, World Bank, by the way, have come down from almost 3 to 1.5. So they have joined me and the Fed is now at about 2, down from 3. Um, we simply don't have the trend line growth potential that we had anywhere in the developed world. Europe is even is even worse. Uh, and, and yes, Australia, Canada probably have a little more oomph uh, with resources and so on and, and New Zealand than the rest of us. But uh, even there, you're, you're going to slow down. You have the same population uh, uh, slowing that we have. You've also written uh, quite a bit about the presidential cycle. What do past presidential cycles uh, suggest may happen in the future? We're heading, obviously, up to midterm elections. And... Yeah, I used to love the presidential cycle because in the old world that we lived in, they were a wonderful demonstration of subtle pressure on the Fed by the, the government. They're completely independent, uh, as I used to like to say, and completely independently, they would decide to stimulate the economy in year three, which would give you a nice residual run-up to the election in year four. Uh, and they did that so effectively that year three, since since FDR, first term, 1932, year three had more performance than the other three added together. That's not bad, you have to admit. And, uh, and not by a little, by the way. And year one and two, where you squeeze the economy so that you'd have some room to stimulate in year three, um, hardly had a positive return at all. When we checked that in the UK, the joke was that they actually had a better 1932 to present effect on the US presidential cycle than the Americans. They were like a hedge fund, a slightly leveraged version of the US. There was not a hint of a prime ministerial uh, or election cycle. Um, if you checked Australia, you'd find it's got a little presidential cycle. Even Japan, who were legendarily different, uh, did did better in year three. The Fed's reach was very powerful. And if you examine the increase in the interest rates, it, it wasn't material. The increase in money supply wasn't material. So how did this come about? It was moral hazard. They made it known. Uh, and the the insiders knew that they could ca count on more support in year three. And and the, the moral hazard is very simple. If it goes wrong, we'll bail you out. If it goes right, you're on your own, which is pretty nice. And that was confined to year three until we hit Greenspan, the infamous, who um, didn't play by the old rules and he insisted on overstimulating in year one and two. So we had uh, 97, 98 up years instead of down years or flat years. They went up steadily the whole time uh, with with plenty of moral hazard from Greenspan. And then you reach year three, 99, it's certainly going to go up. It always does. So it shot through the roof. And then you had the election year 2000, which is meant to be a flat year where you get reelected and everything has become so top heavy, so ludicrously overpriced that led by the internet and then the tech, they collapsed. So he, he broke the game and, and, and spoiled it completely. The next time it worked fine, but then uh, in in the last go round of, of 05, 06, same thing. Nice up years, and they should be down. Of course, 07 is going to be up. And then 08, when you should have a nice quiet re-election, the whole damn thing blows up again. So uh, uh, Greenspan and his and his bootlickers, uh, Bernanke and, and Yellen, all, all the same, all bragging about creating a strong stock market and its wealth effect. And there is a wealth effect. Yeah, that's great. Trouble is there's an anti-wealth effect when the market breaks. And the anti-wealth effect cuts in just when you don't need it, when the economy's under stress. So in 
08, when the market's going down, and 09, you have an anti-wealth effect that hits you up. It seems that uh, President Trump is having a very big impact on animal spirits at the moment. Do you think this is fully reflected in the market? Uh, it's always impossible to know, to disaggregate the effects. There are no numbers you can attach to Trump or his effect. What I do know, however, is what I wrote last year, which was, yes, the U.S. market might do very, very well. It might even be melt up. But I think emerging, if that happens, will do as well, may do even better. And so far, so good. Pretty hard for me to believe that what Trump does plays that big a role in Brazil, Argentina, Thailand, Taiwan, Russia, China. I don't think it does. So this suggests that this is more a global thing. Oh, what a coincidence. This happens to be one of the first times for 10, 15 years that we have a synchronization of global economies. Uh, the headline in one of the economist issues was there isn't a major country with the down GDP forecast. They're all chugging along nicely. Now that should be pretty darn important in getting markets to go up. How about profit margins? Up, ah, global peak. US is actually not a peak. It's very strong, but not a peak. But globally, taking them all together, this is a peak. That should be pretty good, too. So what's not to like in the sense of the influences on the market? The market loves low inflation. We've got global low inflation. It likes GDP stability. We've got GDP stability. It doesn't like growth particularly, but it likes stability. And it likes profit margins. We're at a peak. So this is supplying everything that the global markets like, and the global markets are winning. This does not, therefore, statistically seem very indicative that Trump is the driver. Mm -hmm. Trump is, like most presidents, taking credit for winning the World Cup or, uh, <laughs> or the bad weather or whatever. Uh, this, is, this is not Trump. However, uh, let's, be, let's be fair, he's engineered the last glorious gasp of corporatism. Uh, corporations have been hanging the workers out to dry for the last 30 years. And, and, and gobbling up all the productivity gains before about 1980, uh, productivity was evenly split between the workers and capital. And, and uh, after 19, actually about 1975, all of the productivity gains go to corporations and the super rich, uh, which is not a way you can run an economy indefinitely because they run out of buying power, uh, which we're doing now uh, uh, down at the average guy level. So uh, to get back to his. Um, tax plan. He's engineered a reduction in, in regulations that will help corporate profits and a reduction in, in, in corporate tax. Now, corporate tax is a, is a pass-through, by the way. There's more nonsense written on that. When I was at Royal Dutch uh, uh, as an economist, we used to, uh, every day, hand over to the government three-quarters of our top line. Three-quarters of the Brit tax, same in Australia, is, is a tax. And, and do you think that oil companies made amazing amounts of money because they had this tax collecting function? Absolutely not. They just passed it through and they made the same return on equity that they did in the U U.S., which had no tax on gasoline, worth talking about. So it's a pass through. The problem today is that we're a little monopolistic, a bit sticky, and it won't pass through quickly. So it may take a couple, three years before the whole effect of the corporate tax cut is passed through and competed away. If that doesn't happen, then capitalism has ceased to function and we're in real deep trouble. Um, but for the near term, it will help profit margins, and so will deregulation. We need regulation. Corporations never volunteer to do anything uh, uh, for the what you might call um, the tragedy of the commons. They, they're not going to look after the air. They're not going to look after the oceans. They're not going to look after soil or any of these things. They, they're going to go for maximum short-term profit. And uh, they need regulating. And if you want to deregulate them, which he does, then they'll start pouring acid down the, the, the streams of West Virginia coal areas, which they do now. And they're not going to volunteer to spend money, which is not associated uh, with making a profit. So they need regulation. So anyway, you get a short-term fix. You get a little more wind in the sails of the corporations who have been flying for these last 20 years. And um, that will help the melt-up phase, I think. Mm -hmm. Bit of extra kerosene on the fire. <laughs>
little extra kerosene on the fire. Good for the oil company. <laughs> so we, we kind of touched on this earlier about the spread between cheap and expensive stocks. And uh, any investor in value has suffered uh, approximately nine years, I think it is, of underperformance to growth. Is value broken? Is there some of these things that you talked about, such as profit margin, that are they restraining the forces of mean reversion? Well, it used to be until 20 years ago, for the previous 100, 100 years, if you owned a, a cheap portfolio, you'd outperform five, two, three, four percent a year. Um, and if you had a bad year where you lost by 10, um, you, you'd then have an extra 10 points plus four in the kitty, and you'd have an explosive rally. But you, on average, up and down, you'd go, but you'd a end up over any time period having the best part of four points extra a year if you had the cheapest 10% of PE or price to book. Uh, or better yet, a sexy dividend discount model, which we had. And um, everything worked fine. And since 2000, that has not been the case. So you can get some money if the factor value gets very cheap. If you push it down hard enough, it will bounce back. But what you're not getting is the extra four points a year uh, for showing up. And uh, so if, if the factor didn't change, if it, if it went in normal and came out normal, you'd win by four uh, pre-2000. And since then, if nothing changes, you win by zero. So yes, it is different. Going back to my point, what isn't different? That is one of the many things that has been different in the last 20 years. And, you know, interest rates obviously gone to all-time lows. They've been different. And uh, profit margins have been much, much higher, 70% higher than average of the prior 100 years. So that's been different. And you must expect the world from time to time to change. And the idea that it's always the same is nonsense. I made a bit of a joke with this old uh, John Templeton uh, alleged uh, a phrase about the four most dangerous word, words in the English language are this time is different. Uh, to which I said, no, no, it's almost right. The five most dangerous words in the English language are this time is never different. Um, because if you have real confidence that it's always the same, you're going to end up making magnificent high confidence bets, and, and you're never going to be right. Let me just point out that Japan had never sold over 25 times earnings until it went to 65. That should be at the back of every value manager's mind. It took several years going from 25 to 65. And you cannot survive that. <laughs> Your psyche will not take it. Your clients will definitely not take it. And um, when we went from 21 to 35 for a new record in 2000, our clients did not like it. It was a miracle we had any left. It wasn't, it wasn't bad luck that we lost 60. It was a miracle. Of, of, of to a testimonial to our skill in BS that we had forty percent left. Uh, that's a great, a great warning, I guess, for um, being uh, careful in setting our expectations. But how how does that what you've just uh, discussed in terms of value apply to um, all of these smart beta products that you see? coming out at the moment. You know, they're obviously based on long-term back tests. Yeah, and, and, and of course... picking up that period that you described where there was sort of like a <laughs> yeah, steady lovely. 4% in the bag. Yeah, they came out of the woodwork, of course, uh, exactly at the time when those things started to end. And uh, we'll still be picking through the data, trying to explain what changed uh, 20 years from now. It is not obvious to us, and my God, we've tried, to work out what exactly is different now. Because profit margins still tend to regress at a respectable rate for most companies. One of the things that has changed, which is clear to everybody, is the, the rise of great value destroyers. There were no Amazons and Apples and, and, and so on tramping through the woodwork, crushing competition. Oh, here's the book industry. Whack. Ah, here's the food industry, maybe. One after another. Here's the gasoline 
motor industry. Um, there are really rapidly moving changes and, and very powerful companies that make more money than you could shake a stick at. Um, Apple just announced something like $30 billion of profit for a quarter. And some giant old utility company, one of the biggest in America, announced a quarter where its revenues were a couple of billion. I'm thinking, Jesus, this is a name that existed, you know, 80 years before Apple was thought of. And its revenues are a tiny fraction of Apple's profits. And it's only 10 years ago that Apple was featured as a great value destroyer. <laughs> They'd taken capital and nothing would come out the other end. And in 10 years, they metamorphosed into a monster. So you've got these monsters walking around the planet now. Are they, are they making life very difficult for a, a lot of companies to create value that would have done it without them? So I would list that as one of the many profound changes that have happened. Mm -hmm. And and with government connivance, uh, the power of brands and monopolies has increased and the deals and the takeovers and half the number of companies now no longer exist. We've halved the public companies. And starting a new company, keeping up the vigor of capitalism is just different now. It's just much harder, a moat, to attack these guys. It's very, very deep. And, um, yeah, it's all different. And yes, a good value manager who who is plotting all these things, studying everything, challenging everything. And one of the things you have to challenge is, do you really think the old techniques are going to work? And if so, why? And what about the data of the last 20 years? It's not the data of the last two years. Everything looks different for 20 years, which is getting to be a long, boring time for clients. So um, try and, and, and work out how the new world is working. And, and build value techniques that incorporate some of the changes. I'm not mm -hmm. saying this is easy, and I'm not even saying that we've decoded it, but it's a, a, a problem at a level of complexity that we never had to deal with. Do you um, have any ideas of which tools may not be working and what tools may show some promise? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're full of ideas, none of which I intend to reveal. Fair uh, enough. <laughs> in, in, in this interview. And... Uh, Yes, I, I, I think our quant efforts are definitely regrouping and showing promise last year and this year. We've gotten off to a very good start, despite the fact that value was terrible last year and, and is flat this year. We're, we're, we're doing much better. So I do think some of our new ideas are paying off, and uh, they shoot me if I even hint at them. Okay, well, hopefully we find out more about them in due course. Yes. At, uh just coming back to this idea about tech companies taking over the world, uh, there seems to be a lot of talk lately about the uh, growing backlash against some of them. They all operate with a, a certain social license. And up until now, um, governments haven't been too responsive to their monopolistic nature. And people have been very happy to share private information with them uh, and now there's a bit of a backlash. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you think that's an emerging risk for these companies? And I, I, I think it may well be, and I hope it is. Because uh, I think corporatism, the dominance of corporations in America is total. If, um, if the rich corporations and the rich individuals don't like a bill going into Congress, it will not pass. There's a lot of work being done on that. Mm -hmm. 30, 30 one percent of bills pass and if the general public love it it goes to 32 and if they hate it it goes to 30 it's called gillen's flatline after a professor at princeton uh, but if the rich and powerful corporations get in their lobbying and, and, and threatening um, it goes to 65 pass thank god it's not 100 but if they hate it it goes to zero nothing gets through so the corporations and, and the super rich who are very closely allied, basically run the U.S. system. Representative democracy is pretty well seized. So we need to get the pendulum moving the other way. Capitalism is a pretty neat system, but 
you have to regulate and you can't let it run rampant. I didn't realize I arrived here in 1964. I had no idea it was, I was arriving at the sweet, sweet spot in the social contract. Now, civil rights aside, but for everything else, they were thinking of pensions. They developed these wonderful pension funds. They owed allegiance to the city they were in, the state, and, and of course, the USA. And now none of that is true. And they go to the highest bidder and they maximize their profits and to hell with everything else. Well, they, you can see that with the Amazon bidding war that's going oh, on. Oh, absolutely. Now. Absolutely. The, whichever country wins is going to suffer, uh, whichever city, I should say, wins is going to suffer the bidder's curse there, the winner's curse, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, these guys know how to. They play the game. I mean, capitalism has its has refined its rules. But back in the day, in 1964, a CEO made 40 times the average worker. Seems like a lot, doesn't it? 40 times. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's 350 times. And what can you say about that? I mean, <laughs> and, they, and they haven't made any pro... An hour's work has not changed since 1974. So they had a nice run from 64 to 74, mm -hmm. the last decade of the good, good old era. And and then uh, we have the seventy four on forty years really plus of the rise of of corporate power, and um, we better start pushing the pendulum back a bit. Uh, I don't I don't want to turn into the kind of Labour Party era post World War Two in England, but somewhere between here the total dominance of big capital. And then the total dominance of the trade unions. <laughs> there is a lot of territory, which I think is, is the sweet compromise, uh, a balance. And I think we were pretty close to that in 1964 here. Corporations did fine. The growth rate was much higher. Productivity was terrific. It was the golden era, 60, 64. The 1960s was just brilliant. And um, we're a pale shadow of that kind of growth now. So I, I hope the pendulum goes back. I hope that the Justice Department does something about monopolies. I hope it breaks up a few firms into multiple pieces, which is looks very necessary. I hope it, it regulates, once again, good behavior, particularly for the environment, particularly for climate change, before we're all trying to play tennis in 52 degrees centigrade. <laughs> On court, yes, it's very hot in <laughs> Melbourne. So just uh, wrapping up the interview, one final question. What are some of the most useful mental models that you've used that you think investors uh, should learn and, and use in the way they uh, approach markets? Well, read, read um, Ben Graham's 1963 lecture, the last one he gave, and um, he's re-examining the hard value rules that he talked about and which people swear by, and he's saying, you know, we really underestimated what the market was worth. We gave a testimony to the Senate in 55, and we all agreed that the market was uh, selling at fair value. Now it's gone up 50%. We were clearly wrong. Uh, he said, it, you, you need so much data, the trouble is by the time you've got enough data, the, the underlying realities have changed. This is a wonderful, wise observation. And he said, whatever you do, never get out of the market on, on your strong assumption that it's, it's high enough. Always own some stocks. Because if you get out and it goes up and the game has changed, it will do you so much psycholo psychological damage, you will never be a useful investor again. And we run the, some of the players out there run the risk this time. They're so dedicated to the fact that we, we're going back to 14 times earnings, they might spend the rest of their life stopped out of the market. And uh, so keep an open mind. Uh, reconsider everything. Study the history, but know that it can be different. And, um, and the, it spends long chunks of time being the same and regressing nicely. And then it changes. And you have to Keep your eyes open. Challenge every every thought, every iron rule. Uh, they're no longer iron rules. They're aluminum rules. Do you say aluminium? I don't know. We do say aluminium, yes. Well, uh, these rules are bendable and, 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 and dentable, and the iron rule era has gone. Well, 
Thank you very much for your sage ad, ad, advice and uh, admonitions. I definitely wouldn't categorize it as bullshit or propaganda. I think our listeners will uh, will enjoy hearing this conversation very much. Jeremy, thank you for your time. Oh, that was fun. Good. Thank you for listening to the i3 Insights podcast. For more information, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. Thank you.